Thanks so much, Nancy. We have breaking news. This is like better than CNN here on the boat this afternoon. Uh, uh, Fran Dunwell, uh, who is the special assistant and Hudson River estuary coordinator at uh, New York State DEC, is uh, going to make an announcement right now about the estuary grant program RFP. So um, yesterday, Governor Cuomo released the request for proposals for the Hudson River Estuary Grant Program, which is managed by the Hudson River Estuary Program. I'm the coordinator of that program for New York State DEC. And it occurred to me that many of you might want to apply. Uh, our maximum grant is uh, $50,000, so it can be used for like small docks or for a planning study. And if you just uh, go to any search engine and enter Hudson River Estuary Grants, you will get to our website and you will find a copy of the grant RFP. So I encourage you all to uh, to apply and wanted to make uh, that announcement today to, because we had so many people who I thought might be interested. So thanks for the chance to, to uh, insert myself into your program. Thanks. Thanks, Fran. And now <clears throat> on to our panel. Uh, the panel's uh, name is, as I said, fishable, swimmable, and paddleable. And the tagline is water quality investments for public access and other community and environmental benefits. We've got a fabulous panel here today. Their extended uh, bios are in your books, but I just want to very briefly introduce each of them. And what we're going to be addressing and talking about from their unique and compelling perspectives, um, having listened to them talk among themselves a bit in preparation for today, uh, is that a public dollar spent on repair work for a highly congested bridge has a different marginal value to society and the community than that same dollar spent on a bridge with little congestion. And the question that the musical question that we're going to be discussing is does that concept, uh, that same concept, apply to water quality investments? And is the impact of a dollar spent on water quality improvements uh, in areas that might be less used or of uh, lower ecological value? different than investments in areas of high recreational use uh, or significant ecological value? And should our investments be guided uh, by information about where people and boats are already congesting? Uh, in, in, uh, in addition to the discussions that, uh, and the point of view that each of the panelists uh, will set out at the beginning, we encourage you to fill out the little cards. I'm told you are sitting on them. Um, and uh, MWA folks will be picking them up, and we'd love to have your questions uh, for the panelists. So uh, to my right uh, is first uh, Joan Leary Matthews, who's the director of the Clean Water Division for US EPA Region 2, our, our region, of course. And uh, Joan, why don't you talk a little bit about EPA's perspective on this issue? Sure. <clears throat> Did you want me to do that from here? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Kathy. OK, can you hear me in the, room, in the back of the room? Are we good? Okay, good, great. Uh, I also, I don't think Roland's in the room, but I want to thank him and the MWA for inviting me, uh, getting me away from my desk on <laughs> Earth Week of all weeks. So it's really, it's, how more inspiring does it get than this, right? So this is, this is really great. I'm also pleased to uh, be joined here today by my EPA colleague, Peter Brandt. Peter, there he is. Okay, we work very closely together in trying to get the EPA message out. Um, and today I'll be focusing on uh, water quality. So my main point for you this afternoon is that water quality will continue to be EPA's primary focus in the harbor and around the states of New York and New Jersey. Um, I should tell you that part of my territory in Region 2 also includes Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's not the topic today, but it's a very nice gig. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I invite you to join me in keeping that, meaning water quality, the first and primary focus in these discussions. From enhanced and protected water quality, 
we will see improvements in all other areas, areas of the harbor and river. I know there's a separate uh, panel on Sandy, but the impacts of the storm are an excellent opportunity for us to examine the dramatic effects on harbor water quality, and we all know that uh, only too well. Uh, after Sandy, it was a race to get essential services up and running. Few were more essential than clean drinking water and the treatment of raw sewage. So I have a few stories to tell you about. Flooding, power outages, and debris took their toll on drinking water and wastewater treatment facilities in impacted areas of New Jersey and New York. Two plants that are near here in particular stood out. And the first one is the PVSC plant, Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission plant in Newark. It happens to be the fifth largest plant in the nation serving 48 municipalities. And it was really damaged, you know, badly damaged by the storm. It was flooded by more than 200 million gallons of water from the storm surge. Power was knocked out so the raw sewage couldn't be treated. The, really the entire plant was crippled. And billions of gallons of sewage began being released into the Passaic River, which flows into Newark Bay. An estimated 4.4 billion gallons of sewage went into the water before the repairs were completed. EPA worked on site with PVSC, the New Jersey DEP, the Corps, and FEMA to remove wastewater from the plant, fix the damaged equipment, and find safe solution, solutions for sludge disposal. EPA flew in our staff from Texas who had experience with, some, with these issues after Hurricane Katrina and it was really interesting to work with them. We helped get the plant back to doing limited sewage treatment within about a week. I think that's an incredible feat and everybody just shows you how all, everybody comes, comes together to make this happen. So a week it was just extraordinary. And at the same time, the Middlesex County Utility Authority's wastewater plant in Sayreville was also damaged. And that plant, which treats about 110 million gallons of wastewater every day, lost power to two of three pump stations. And so, this is going to sound a little gross, but it happened. Uh, sewage burst up from manholes onto local streets, and about 50 million gallons of untreated sewage went into the Washington Canal, which flows into Raritan Bay. A 6,000-pound gate underwater in the sewage that controls the flow of sewage was badly damaged, and we couldn't stop the flow of sewage until that gate was fixed. The gate was still underwater because of the storm and in and around all kinds of sewage. It was fixed thanks to some amazing work by two divers who dove into the raw sewage under very dangerous conditions to install a new gate and to stop the flow of sewage. We had a brown bag luncheon at EPA uh, shortly after this, and the divers were there, explained to us what they had done, and I'm glad I didn't know exactly at the time how dangerous it was. They told me it was dangerous, but when we heard it from them, it was really remarkable to hear, but they really did so many people such great service. Our experiences after the storm made it clear that we need to do more to give these facilities the resiliency to withstand the impacts of major storms and green infrastructure plays a, a vital role here. As a result of Sandy, EPA has provided the states with over a half billion dollars to help drinking water and wastewater treatment plants impacted by Sandy improve their resiliency to storms. So this is the EPA money in the Sandy Supplemental Bill, and you know that HUD and FEMA and other agencies have different pots of money, but that's the EPA money. In total, Sandy costs taxpayers more than $60 billion, showing the need to invest now in improving infrastructure resiliency. We've got to get this done before the next storm. EPA is taking action to address stormwater right here in EPA's Region 2, particularly focused on combined sewer overflows, or CSOs. And I think that most of you here know that CSOs are a major challenge that older communities face. And let's face it, we are older communities here in the Northeast. There are 224 active CSO outfalls in New Jersey and 966 in New York. These outfalls include raw sewage, industrial waste, toxic materials, and debris into the local waters. It makes swimming, obviously, boating and fishing almost impossible. It's a public health threat. 
There are, you can get waterborne infections, skin, wound, respiratory, and ear infections. And this is the Debbie Downer part of this presentation. Sorry about that. It can cause beach closures, kill fish, close shellfish beds, and contaminate drinking water supplies. So one of our priorities is to dramatically reduce sewage pollution and the public's ex uh, uh, exposure to contaminated water. And that is a priority for our uh, sister agencies, our, our states, and our cities, too. EPA has taken action to enforce CNO, CSO requirements in New Jersey and New York. And with, with Angela here on the panel, she can speak to the great efforts that New York City is making. So I'll just touch for a few minutes on New Jersey. It's a good story to tell there. We have taken enforcement action in or settled cases with Newark, Patterson, Jersey City, and Perth Amboy. And in the past year, the New Jersey DEP has issued 26 draft CSO permits, and the DEP expects to finalize them this year. These permits require localities to submit long-term control plans, and green infrastructure will be a major part of those plans. This was many, many years in the making, and we're seeing it come to fruition. So that really is a wonderful story to tell, and EPA will, will be there to see it through to the end. In addition to sound rebuilding, green infrastructure is part of a bigger solution for water quality and is certainly practical, economical, and sustainable. People promoting green infrastructure are literally planting trees. They are literally growing roots. They're cultiva cultivating and nurturing an idea that will grow and develop and strengthen over time. And EPA is behind them in these efforts. EPA is looking for evergreen solutions, and we're also working to scale up green infrastructure technology so that it becomes more effective and more affordable. Stormwater management is a challenge that communities have faced for quite some time. Sewer systems of the 19th and, and early 20th centuries are marvels of the Industrial Revolution. More Debbie Downer. Cholera. <laughs> One of the plagues of the 19th century was effectively wiped out in the Western world by effective storm and wastewater management. Many argue that Paris's great engineering achievement is not the Eiffel Tower, but the sewer system that allowed the city to become one of the largest in Europe. Gray infrastructure was certainly a breakthrough 200 years ago. It's time for another breakthrough. It's time for a 21st century solution to stormwater management to improve water quality. And that's green infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Uh, to Joan's right is Angela Licata, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability for New York City's DEP. And in that position, she, among many other things, she oversees the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis and the Bureau of Environmental Compliance and the Office of Green Infrastructure and has a lot to say about that. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel like the name of the panel should maybe be swimmable, fishable, and sailable today. Um, but... Uh, Clearly, we have a lot to discuss, and I really appreciated hearing the EPA's um, very inspirational stories about, um, you know, wastewater treatment plants and its resiliency, and with respect to green infrastructure and finding more innovative um, solutions to the issues that plague us with respect to um, pollution that is really part of our legacy system um, of having built sewers um, for, you know, a hundred years, and now looking at repurposing purposing our waterfront because um, so much of it had been previously used for an industrial purpose. Um, now we see a um, resurgence in interest and in people wanting to um, be a part of the waterfront, to experience it it not only by, you know, viewing it and um, having esplanades, but also by really getting into it and being very intimate with the water. So just a little bit about DEP before I begin. DEP, um, New York City DEP, that is, is a drinking water and wastewater agency. So we are responsible for providing over 1 billion gallons of drinking water every day to about 9 million New Yorkers, about 8.4 in the city, um, and another community of users up in the watershed. 
And um, we also treat about 1.4 billion gallons of wastewater each day at 14 wastewater treatment plants. So it's a very, very big system. Um, and with respect to the sewer systems, we have both combined sewers in New York City. That's about 60% of the area. And then we also have separate um, sewers, which means that the sanitary sewer carries one load and the storm sewers carry the other load. So that's definitely the more preferred approach. But again, as an older city, um, originally they built a combined system so that the sanitary flow in the combined system is really a very small portion of flow during the rain. And then when it rains, you have two times um, the uh, baseline flow getting to the treatment plants and being treated. So we treat to a very high level um, at these 14 plants, but there's also a certain rain events where the overflow um, that cannot be treated at the plants is diverted into the waterways. And that's what we have, and that's what we refer to as a combined sewer overflow. So New York City DEP has really been through an unprecedented um, period of investments. We've been investing in our wastewater and in our drinking water. We have invested um, about $9.9 .9 billion over the last 10 years in wastewater alone. Um, and probably about 62% of the whole capital plan was for mandated projects. So for projects that would comply with environmental laws and regulations. And um, the story there is really that the debt that you pay on those capital commitments really comes due over time. So while we have had um, a 10-year period of extreme investment, the next 10 years we're projecting now at about $12.2 billion of investments over the next 10 years. But the lag time for the debt service will cost us about um, $27 billion um, just in servicing that debt. So we really have to be mindful of the water rates. Um, we have a announced just yesterday a 3.25 or 3.35 um, percent um, increase in our water and sewer rates. And um, we believe that, you know, we should continue to invest in this system. Um, and we want to do that, but we need to do that responsibly. We need to consider the fact that our rates have increased um, probably about 160 percent over the last 10 years. And while we still think our value, the value of the New York City water is really good, it's less or just about a penny a gallon. Um, but the effect that that has on the lower income families in New York City um, can be considerable. So when you look at the income distribution across the city, it's the lowest quintile of the population that is really living in poverty and they are um, probably make up about 1.7 million people. So there's a lot of people that are paying for water and um, sewer services and really feel that um, it's, you know, um, a big stretch to pay for that service. In New York City, you're paying a lot for your shelter costs and transportation costs. So all of these costs really layer on. So all that said, what we want to do is really to invest wisely. We want to invest in um, to get the best value. So the um, experience that we have now is that we are facing all of these priorities for investments. Um, what we would like to see is our wastewater treatment plants and our water supply system be more resilient to climate changes and um, to severe storm events. In 2007 and 2008, we had unprecedented um, rainfall in New York City and um, followed by Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. Um, we experienced um, horrendous conditions within the water supply system and here in New York City with respect to local flooding. And then of course with um, Superstorm Sandy, we had a tremendous storm surge. So as we were planning for climate change and we thought that we would have to you know, grapple with all of these issues, 20 years from now, suddenly we were faced with um, the types of experiences that we might have in the future when we realized that we really had to think about, you know, how do we make our system more resilient? So we have that bucket of priorities. And then um, just recently we've been, been negotiating with New York State DEC a stormwater permit 
for the um, separate sewer system that I described earlier. So the stormwater permit would have us um, prioritizing the stormwater controls so that um, the stormwater that is then discharged has some level of stormwater management, some level of pollutant reduction, because remember, that system does not go to a treatment plant. There's no pretreatment. The separate storm sewers um, take the sanitary flow to the treatment plants, but the storm um, water flow goes directly out. And so we're also looking at um, the drinking water system. We know that we have a big leak on one of our aqueducts, and we have about $700 million in the 10-year plan for repairing that aqueduct. Um, we're making great preparations for um, augmenting the water supply so that we can take that Delaware aqueduct offline. Um, in fact, we're also looking at conservation programs. We're targeting another 50 MGD of um, water supply conservation for that purpose. And so, you know, that just the reason I'm, I'm telling you all of this and you say, well, what does this all have to do with um, clean of water in the harbor is that, you know, the department is faced with a lot of priorities. So when we look at um, what we have as a really um, near term task, with respect to preparing, and I think you um, talked very briefly about long-term control plans. Um, these are plans that are supposed to guide the investment and the way in which we will tackle these combined sewer overflows. So New York City has 10 to prepare by 2017. So we'd like to encourage all of you to really, you know, get involved in that planning process, to talk to us about the priorities, the water bodies, um, where we think that um, people might be um, really wanting to improve the level of access, where people think that um, potentially a water body has a chance to really recover if there was a cash infusion. You know, we're looking to say, well, what would be the best investment to these tributaries? Because when you look out at the harbor, you have about 90% of the water um, ways in New York City meeting current standards. It's just in these tributaries, the Gowanus Canal, Newtown Creek, the Bronx River, all of those inland tributaries that, again, are part of this legacy past, this industrial past. They were used for industry. They were used for commerce. Um, and now we want to repurpose them. So which of these water bodies um, should really get the investments? Which should of them, I believe all of them, should get investments um, over time? When the question is, and the choices that we have, are should we um, spend equally in all places and move incrementally forward? Or should we have have some water bodies prioritized over other water bodies and see if we can't bring about some um, near-term improvements at those locations. Um, also, I just want to talk briefly about the New York City's green infrastructure program. We have a $2.4 billion, 20-year green infrastructure program in New York City. We're prioritizing all of these tributaries because we consider those to be um, where the water quality benefits are needed most. So that's where we'll be building our green infrastructure. And you will see an explosion of what we call these right-of-way bioswales and green streets folks are familiar with green streets, um, the general practice um, at the surface will appear very much like a planted um, strip. But what's happening below is that the water is being directed in an inlet, and then there's um, soil and constructed um, gravel beds below that that can handle and detain the storm water before it enters the sewer system. So again, those are tremendous, um, really, advances in the way that we treat and manage storm water because people can enjoy the co-benefits of green infrastructure. They help to cool the urban environment. They can provide pollinators um, or corridors for pollinators and improve um, the habitat within the um, areas where they're built because they're really quite concentrated. And um, they, uh, what, what didn't I mention? Well, anyway, just air quality benefits um, in general. So am I over my time? Keep yes. going? OK. Um, so basically, I think I will just sum up by saying, you know, we, we have an issue associated with um, being a very healthy city, wanting to make investments, and really um, being faced with priorities and needing to take those resources um, very seriously, um, knowing that they're scarce, knowing that you know the waste uh, 
the consumers of the water are the ones that are paying the bills. And so what we want to do is we want to invest um, smartly and we want to make sure that the value of the investment is, is really um, driving the program. Thank you so much for your patience. Thanks, Angela. Our next panelist is Captain John Melizia. He's a founding member and the current vice president of the Fishermen's Conservation Association, and he's also president of the Staten Island chapter of that association. Plus, uh, he serves on a number of regional and national organizations that promote fishing and healthy waterways and support storm recovery, among other uh, activities. And we're very fortunate to have him here today. John, what's your take? My take? Well, thank you, anyway. <laughs> you know, you gave me a big, uh, a, a big body of, of, of credentials. I don't know if I fit all of them, but uh, I do somehow get involved in a lot of different situations. One of the organizations I belong to is uh, grassroots. Well, all the organizations I belong to are primarily grassroots. We're all volunteers. And we get a lot accomplished with minimal help. Okay, one of the groups is Natural Resources Protective Association, which has been from Staten Island, which has been involved in the estuary for since 1977. You know, that group, minimal as it was, fought the Army Corps of Engineers, or not fought, but uh, expresses interest in the waterways around our area where the Army Corps of Engineers want, want to, wants to dump contaminated dredge materials back into the waterway. What does that mean? Oh, now we got the fish that's going to be contaminated. Oh, maybe I can't fish. Oh, the bait is going to be all, going to be looking like whatever. I don't know. but So we've been fighting them for many, many years, and we and try to control where they want to put the dredge materials. Lately, uh, they've been putting uh, some of the dredge materials, which meet a minimum criteria, at the uh, HARS, which is the Historic Area Radiation Site. You know, they used to dump heavy chemicals, uh, waste, into the HARS. Uh, and that's, they used to be called the mud dump. And with a lot of groups from Staten Island, New York, and New Jersey, we were able to stop the uh, Army, well, not the Army Corps, but other groups from dumping there. You know, it was, it was an orange lay on the water. You know, it was disgusting, it smelled disgusting, and it looked disgusting. Uh, we also do beach cleanups, you know, as well as marshes and the Blue Belt. Uh, this is done with volunteers, mostly kids, who, who want to have a clean environment so they could swim and fish while getting their community hours. Uh, you know, there's toxic waste that we talked and you, it was mentioned the Passaic River, the EPA. Thank God is working on that, <laughs> right? Thank you. Uh, and that's where dioxin is coming from, Agent Orange. You know, uh, Agent Orange is, where the, is what they used in uh, Vietnam to uh, eliminate some of the Vietnamese. Okay, but we also have PCBs and other chemicals because a lot of chemical plants in the, on the New Jersey waters, especially uh, in the, on the Passaic, the kill, the ought to kill, Newark Bay, whatever. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of dumping. Now there's a lot of cleaning up. Why are we cleaning up? So we clean up the fish, so we could clean up the waters, so we could actually boat, swim, and have enjoy ourselves. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. We support uh, many groups in the area, and that's coalitions. So a lot of coalitions help make that announcement. Hey, EPA, let's clean up something over here. <laughs> but the Army Corps does do some good stuff. You know, they're, they're actually working in Jamaica Bay, planting sawgrass. Now the problem was, how did the sawgrass get lost? 
well, there's, they talk about pollution, you know, talk about the waterway itself. You know, there's a lot of, they don't know exactly why some of the sawgrass was missing a couple of islands, matter of fact, and they're rebuilding those. Uh, you know, the Gowanus Canal, we were just passed, was that pretty heavily contaminated body of water. Uh, and they started cleaning it up. What's happening there? Oh, people are going down to Gowanus. Maybe they're, they're putting restaurants nearby. You know, some people fish. They actually catch fish. <laughs> they don't eat the fish, but they actually catch the fish. You know, and there was an announcement, you know, the uh, Newtown Creek, my cohort next, next to me uh, <laughs> initiated with the EPA. They're going to start cleaning that up. And maybe people get, enjoy the water in that area. You know, go fishing, maybe. <laughs> but enjoy at least a clean area. Don't have to smell the pollution. Don't have to look at the pollution. Enjoy that area. You know, I belong to Fishermen's Conservation Association. What does that mean? You know, fishing is one of the things I like. I enjoy the resources. You know, I swim, I boat, I fish. You know, not that, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time. But the fish get impacted by pollution. You know, fish have a sense, hey, this is garbage, let's get out of here. They don't come back for a while. You know, but sometimes they, they don't have the right way. They, they say, well, yeah, let me taste it. Now we got a fish advisory, we can't eat this, we can't eat that. You know, it's dry bass, which is right under us right now, is one of our biggest uh, pleasures, at least for the Fishermen's Conservation Association. You know, we would like to make it a, a game fish. Uh, and we'll talk about that later, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we have a, a something called the Manhattan Cup. Manhattan Cup, as it says, was out of Manhattan, and it's a striped bass game and release program. Okay, where did they catch the fish? Oh, there's the Statue of Liberty right there. Oh, maybe by the Battery Tunnel. Oh, up the Hudson, up the East River, Raritan Bay, Jamaica Bay. Why? Because it's getting cleaner. Boy, it's great. It's great to live around here. But we also like to have create habitat like reefs with oysters, possibly. You know, work, we work with New York City Parks for access of our beaches, the jetties and the esplanades. Uh, esplanades, I got a, today, uh, an enlightenment to me, or a tick to me. We have esplanades, but we all talked about using them, walking them on, on them, you know, uh, riding on them, enjoying the water. We didn't talk about fishing. Maybe access is a problem. I mean, we talked about access to the waterway, but we didn't talk, away, talk about access to the fish. You ever see a kid catch his first fish? You, you'll, you'll start crying. They catch that first fish, they go from a frown to the biggest smile you ever saw. I mean, it's great. So we need more fishing. We need access to the fish. You know, tell everybody in the, our groups downstairs, get us some piers, you know, put some more rocks, get Get on the, let, it, let us fish these waters. Now there's a lot of surf guys. Surf guys are guys that go in the water up to their necks and fish. You know, in the mornings, nights, whatever. And they do a lot of fishing. But they need the access. Now with Sandy, some of that access is controlled or in, unable, we're unable to get to the points we used to get because we got sand dunes which will protect the homes around the area. Maybe we need to a way to access, get access over the sand dunes to the beach, into the water. So, you know, we, we help wounded warriors. You know, that is one of our assets that we really have to protect, our warriors. <coughs> you see these guys with missing limbs come on a boat and go fishing. They love it. So we gotta protect the fish. We got to, got to protect the fish. 
Now, we also support oyster reefs, beds, to help us clean the water. Oysters clean water. Now, at one time, just to point information, Staten Island was the major oyster farming area in the New World. We, su we supplied Europe with oysters. There is not many oysters in Raven Bay anymore. <laughs> you know why? Because we all eat or fished it or pollution. But now we're starting to get back. You know, we have a couple of groups that are working on the oysters to make sure they, they're livable, they can work in, the, in our waterways. New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, you know, uh, actually they had a farm in, in, in Keyport and it was closed down by the DEC. Uh, excuse me, DEP. <laughs> Got to get those things right, you know, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> New Jersey DEP. Sorry. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Uh, we're sensitive. Uh, we should be sensitive. Everything should be correct. And we should call the right groups at the right time. <laughs> okay, but uh, now what was I talking about? I don't know. <laughs> Oysters. Oysters, yeah, right. So uh, the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper were farming oysters off of Keyport, New Jersey. And what happened? They were told to close the, bed, the farm. Why? Because there was, they, Raritan River did not meet certain qualifications for the New Jersey, New Jersey DEP. And it fed the Raritan uh, Bay. So they asked them to uh, dig up the oysters, move them someplace. And the uh, Navy took arms and said, hey, we got a pier over here, and we control it, not <laughs> New Jersey. So the oysters are being, were planted back in, into the waters of Raritan under the, the, uh, the pier, uh, the Navy pier, which is the ammunition pier. So they're working there. But there's other areas where, where we're planting oysters, which are coming very effective. John, if I may. You're not finished. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not finished. <laughs> You're not, but perhaps we'll come back. I can tell that you have wonderful additional stories and we want to hear them uh, but let's see if we can get through sure. the initial panel statements thank you very much thank you everybody our, our next panelist is philip musigas who's the uh, hudson river program director for riverkeeper and in that role uh, among a range of campaigns he works on reducing sewage pollution and restoring native fisheries <clears throat> Philip is uh, also the representative from Riverkeeper on the city's green infrastructure task force and special initiative for rebuilding and resiliency. Uh, Philip. All right, thanks, Kathy. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Great. Um, so I want to thank Roland and, and MWA for inviting us to talk about this issue today. And I think, um, you know, I really like the way the question for this panel was phrased because it's a it's a tough question that I think we're all dealing with. I mean, DEP and the city with EPA and the state oversight deal with this very directly, and I think they have the most complicated job. Um, but for us as public advocates, we also have to figure out you know, where we're going to put our limited resources and what communities and what areas of the harbor and the estuary we're going to support and put our energy into. And of course, we want to see fishable, swimmable water everywhere in New York City. That's probably not going to happen right away and it's going to take a long time. But uh, just going to talk for a minute about Riverkeeper's history and our uh, water quality sampling work, which I think is really relevant to this particular panel, and then talk about some other initiatives that are underway uh, in terms of public notification of sewage discharges and, um, and where we can actually, you know, how we can make better decisions about how to invest our limited resources. So. Riverkeeper, for folks who are not familiar with us, we have been uh, working on the Hudson for over 40 years. Our mission is what you would expect. We're working to protect and restore the Hudson River. We patrol the Hudson from uh, just above Albany, above the Troy Dam, all the way down to the Battery. So we cover about 156 miles, um, most of the estuary, and in fact, pretty much all the estuary. And um, our focus uh, traditionally has been on water pollution, pollution enforcement, um, 
working on uh, some power plant issues that uh, affect fisheries, restoring native fisheries, the Hudson's fish uh, populations. Uh, you know, we have some good stories. The striped bass are certainly a success story, I think. Uh, but we have a lot, unfortunately, a lot of, um, of stories where fisheries are declining. The American shad fishery, which is a historically a, uh, a, a, a key historic species, um, is in severe decline, and that fishery was closed. Uh, Atlantic sturgeon and short-nosed sturgeon, which are kind of signature species on the Hudson, are also endangered. And so there's a lot of work to be done on, on fisheries. And I think um, you know, public access to fishing is extremely important because when you get the public out on the water, you get them out uh, fishing, and you educate them about what fish are out there and what fish are not out there, then you build a constituency to support cleaning up the river and restoring these fisheries. So, um, so I'm going to shift a little bit. We, uh, Riverkeeper has been doing a water quality sampling program for about the last eight years. We started, we started in 2006, and then we've been doing it uh, across the estuary since about 2008. And so we have about 75 sampling locations uh, up and down the Hudson River. We have about 15 locations in and around New York City. And we have uh, basically a mini laboratory on our Riverkeeper boat. So we take the water samples ourselves and we sample for sewage indicating bacteria. So we sample for Enterococcus, which is a, a good indicator if you have pollution in the, in, the, in the water that's related to sewage discharges. And I think Joan mentioned a combined sewer overflows and and certainly Angela mentioned that. That's really the biggest kind of ongoing um, problem in terms of water quality around the city that we have. You know, we've been very successful at cutting off um, unpermitted discharges from industrial companies and oil spills and things like that. We're still cleaning up the remnants of that, but our, our main focus, speaking for Riverkeeper, and I think for uh, the regulatory agencies, is, is dealing with sewage pollution. And that's the stuff that affects public health and puts public health at risk when people are out uh, swimming or kayaking or canoeing uh, around the harbor. So um, uh, we've been collecting data for about uh, about five to eight years. The data shows generally that the water quality is generally fairly good. There are some hot spots around the harbor. Um, Newtown Creek and Gowanus are, are certainly uh, obvious ones. Uh, and there are hot spots up on the upper, upper part of the Hudson as well. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, so what we're seeing trend-wise is generally good during dry weather, um, if you're sampling in the East River, you're generally going to find um, good water quality, and you're generally you're fine to be out there in a kayak or, or a canoe. Um, in the smaller waterways, you're going to have a little more a little more concern, but you can you can be in Newtown Creek in dry weather and be fine. And when we have wet weather, um, and it doesn't have to be a major rainstorm, when you have something around a 0.2 inches of rain, you can have a combined sewer overflow, and you can have pollution going into our waterways that can risk public health. So um, in terms of this panel and this discussion, I think when we're looking at how we invest in water infrastructure to improve water quality, two things we need to do uh, that are critically important. I think one is we need good data to drive how we're investing. And I, I think we are on the road to having good data. We certainly have. We've been collecting data for a short period of time. New York City has been doing their harbor survey program for a, a, a fair, I don't know how long actually, years. over 100 years. Um, so there's good data out there, but there are a lot of data gaps. And, and the simplest one I'm going to talk about today is where the samples are taken. Uh, so Riverkeeper, again, we, we uh, don't sample everywhere in the harbor. We don't sample every single day. We're out about once a week on a patrol. And so our sampling, when you look at our water, our, uh, water quality website on the Riverkeeper site, you'll see the data where it's about a little over once a week we have data that's posted up on our site. Um, we tend to sample at a mixture of locations, some mid-channel. So we'll sample at the Battery mid-channel. We'll sample at the George Washington Bridge mid-channel. Uh, but we also sample near shore. We'll sample at the 125th Street Pier on the Hudson River. We'll sample in Newtown Creek at Dutch Kills and in some other locations. And we think it's critically important to sample near shore because uh, for two main reasons. One, that's generally where most people are recreating. That's where people are kayaking, canoeing. That's where, when you're talking about public recreation and access, I think that's where it's important to know what the water quality is like. Um, and, and the other reason is, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, you're rubbing off of me. <laughs> 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 uh, <it's like> <laughs> oh, the, uh, 
uh, yeah. Well, you know what? I'll come back to that. I mean, the main the main reason is that is that is where people are recreating, um, and our concern, or I guess something that we've been working on for some time, is is uh, uh, when DEP, when the city does their harbor sampling, they actually generally sample uh, mid channel and away from shore. Not always entirely mid channel, but their their program is generally focused on sampling away from the shorelines. And so um, while their data collection is is good, and I think it's done that way for a particular regulatory purpose, uh, they're sampling and they're looking at water quality based on rolling averages and uh, uh, in general water quality throughout the, the uh, waterways around New York City. It doesn't give us good data about uh, the water that on a day-to-day -day basis that people are recreating in. And, and um, we have a, a cliche phrase that we always like to say at Riverkeeper, which is uh, nobody swims in average water. Uh, when people are out in the water, they're out in whatever water quality it happens to be that day. And so we really think there's a critical need if we're going to figure out where we're going to invest and improve water quality, we need to do it. Uh, we need to find out what the water quality is like where people are recreating on as, as often, a, as frequent a basis as we can so that we get good data. Um, and oftentimes, unfortunately, around New York City, uh, the places where people are recreating, whether they're kayaking or canoeing or they're you know, wading in the water, or they're just trying to cool off on a hot summer day. Uh, those are locations that are very near combined sewer overflow discharges. The literally the outfall pipes that are discharging untreated sewage and wastewater and stormwater uh, are very close to places where people are boating and, and sailing. So, how are we doing on time? Good. All right. Okay. Um, so the you know the data is critically important, and I think that you know if we if we do additional sampling, and I think you know hopefully. I'm not putting you on the spot at all, but I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways. I think our, our sampling on a limited basis has filled some of these gaps, but I think we could we could do a lot more together to have a better sense of, of what their water quality is like. Um, I also want to talk about um, the fact that uh, there's also, you know, when you talk about Coney Island Beach or uh, Jones Beach, there are areas where people are known to swim and are designated swimming beaches where there is much more frequent sampling done and it's done at the beach. And if the water is contaminated in those types of locations, uh, then there's usually a decision made to close the beach or to limit access to it. The challenge for us here in the estuary as a whole and what we've seen not only in New York City but up upriver is that um, that's not the only place people go in the water. Of course, in New York City, we have uh, a great evolution of people coming back to the waterfront, uh, new kayak launch sites uh, everywhere from Flushing Bay to the Lower East Side, to Newtown Creek. We have boat clubs coming up and wanting to get out on the water. Um, so we need to do better sampling at those locations. But the fact is we, we have to, I think, recognize that the entire estuary is being used as a quote unquote beach. There's access everywhere. You know, there are places on the upper Harlem River, uh, let's see, but right, right underneath the Broadway Bridge on uh, near Spite and Dival, where every summer we, on our patrols, we see people, people fishing and swimming from a street end. So they literally just climb over the wall at the end of the street and they work their way down to the water and they get in the water and there's a CSO discharge near there. So, you know, uh, one of the questions, we had a discussion before the panel, uh, among the panelists before this uh, conference about, you know, well, how, about existing uses and uh, how are people using the water and how, we, how do we figure out where people are recreating that's something that we need to do, um, I think, very urgently. So we need better data to figure out what the water quality is like. And integral to that is we need to figure out where people are getting in the water. And of course, that ranges. There are very obvious locations. Um, the kayak launches that we know about at Brooklyn Bridge Park, I think, is, is well known that people are getting in the water there. We have the designated swimming beaches, but we also have to look at, at what I call kind of the informal access points where people are getting in the water. Uh, the last thing I'll mention just very briefly, um, I think when you talk about getting better data and you talk about how people are using the resource, um, public notification of sewage discharges is a very important point. And New York State passed a law last year actually requiring public notification every time there is a, um, a discharge of untreated sewage from a, basically from a sewage treatment plant or its facilities. And uh, we push very hard to get that law passed because we strongly believe that if you can inform people about when and where pollution is happening in the waterway, you can build a constituency that's going to support investing in the water infrastructure to make the water better. It's a, it's a simple proposition. And uh, 
uh, you need to do that obviously also to protect public health, but we need to do it uh, so that people can make informed choices about how they are recreating and, and getting into the waterway. Um, and we're very happy to see New York City taking, uh, I think, such a strong stance. I know Amanda Burden and the Waterfront 2020 plan, um, you know, really, really pushing this idea that there's this amazing resource that's available to everyone. I mean, there, there's been some discussion today about economic disparities and, and EJ issues, but, um, you know, public access to the water for fishing or, or, or uh, kayaking or, or swimming, even in certain situations, is, is, uh, is a, it's a public trust resource that we should all be able to use, I think, without fear of, of becoming ill when we use it. So uh, I think I will end there. I, I want to make sure we have time for discussion and make sure we have time for, for you. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Our next panelist is Dr. Mark Berkman. Uh, this is a change of player from your uh, program. Dave Sunding from Berkeley got called away a couple of days ago by the governor of California to go give some legislative testimony on the drought, which they, I know you are all aware, are pretty hysterical about in California at this point. And uh, Mark graciously agreed uh, to fill in and came from San Francisco to be with us today. So I think he gets the Greatest Miles Traveled Award. Uh, Mark, Mark's an expert in applied microeconomics, and he's focused his work for 30 years on environmental economics. And I just want to tell you where he went to school, because uh, it's a nice lineup and you don't have a bio for him. He's got his BA from George Washington, his MA from Harvard, and his PhD from Wharton. So, uh, uh, Mark, what's your take on, on uh, the topics? Um, I have no idea. I'm with John. Um, <laughs> uh, um, no, I think it's, 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 it was really quite interesting to hear very different perspectives from everyone here who was all, all has the same broad objective, um, which is the title of the talk, which is to create uh, water around the New York metropolitan area that's fishable, swimmable, and paddable. Paddleable, and I say that word. Um, so, but this, and so, despite that commonality, um, there clearly are. Uh, I'm not sure I would go as far as disputes, but certainly differences of opinion as to how to prioritize um, what's being done and who should do it. Um, and as an economist, um, we're often called upon to answer to help answer that first question: that is, how to prioritize. And so, certainly at a minimum. Um, Improving water quality, as Joan pointed out, is the EPA's objective. Um, you know, rises all fish uh, swimmers and paddlers, um, but it doesn't rise them all equally necessarily because, as we just heard um, uh, from Philip, there's really varying water quality throughout the region, and so we're not going to see an instantaneous improvement everywhere uh, when we begin to, well, as we continue to make improvements in, in a variety of ways. In some very expensive ways. I mean, all this, all the effort with respect to the CSOs is very expensive work, and that's why we're seeing the kind of rate increases we're seeing in New York City and, and other cities as well. New York is not alone. The infrastructure for water and sewer separation is lacking in almost all major cities. Um, we're, we're starting to work on a project out in San Francisco, where the system, some of parts of the system are over a hundred years old and made of wood. Um, so there, there are real problems in, in most bigger, older cities uh, as a consequence. So it's not surprising that um, one priority is to deal with that problem uh, because it's such a large one. And, and there, are, there are huge economies of scale as well, which means that very large government organizations are going to be largely responsible for those. Um, but even those uh, organizations are faced with the same priority problem. And I thought that um, the Angela pointed it out quite clearly. I mean, they, they recognize, I think as she put it, that they have value-driven programs. So they're, they're clearly making an attempt um, to recognize that they, since you can't do everything at once, there has to be some order imposed, and that order should be based on, um, to, to put it in a very vernacular way, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, what can we get done uh, most effectively and at the lowest cost um, but recognizing that at the same time, 
uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we go after the dirtiest water first. Um, the dirtiest water may be the most expensive to eliminate, and as a consequence, we go after the important stuff that we can we can do in large scale first. So that again, the sewage problem is a really large one. It has a huge effect on on, on quality overall, and it affects all these uses. But beyond that, I'm, I know for a fact that New York Harbor has other contaminants in it um, that clearly affect certain uses more than others, so that we may get it clean enough so we don't have bacterial levels that prevent swimming or kayaking, but they may still have heavy metals or, so, or other constituents that don't do fish any good or oysters uh, or, uh, or other plants and animals that, that currently exist in the bay and used to thrive that don't anymore. And so you have all these different competing um, uh, problems, uh, all of which can't be solved with a single program or even a, a common program done by multiple agencies. And so what, what strikes me is that this group represents a tremendous number of different interests. So, I mean, I think if you ask John if he had his way, um, uh, he'd protect the fish first. Uh, you know, and I think EPA's view is that, well, we're protecting everyone and, and everything by focusing on overall quality. And it sounds like what New York City is doing, what the DEP in New York is doing, is is kind of blending that, I would say, to some extent. I mean, the, the, the green programs clearly is a way of looking at doing things uh, in a, in a, uh, a more cost-effective way, perhaps, than the CSOs um, by, by directing water to places where it's naturally, ten the pollutions are naturally attenuated. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you, there has to be some way of prioritizing this, and that's true both for these big projects, by these big agencies, and, and by each one of you who represents a, a different objective. Uh, and that's where I think um, both the, an economic model of the kind I'll, I'll speak about briefly uh, and the data uh, requirements that Philip was talking about are really essential here. And, and I think... Um, that the latter point can't be, can't be emphasized enough that in order to make the right decisions, we have to know more about the problems um, and we have to collect the kind of data that helps us answer that. Now, I, I know that there's a great deal of data already collected here. Um, I know there's, there at least historically has been, I haven't worked on a project uh, on the, related to New York beaches in a while now, but um, there's usually really good annual attendance data and in fact daily attendance data that you can correlate to both uh, bacterial counts or track alongside, I should say, bacterial counts uh, and, uh, and uh, air quality and, and weather conditions and so on. So there's been a lot of studies done, including some that I've done, you know, which try to predict um, uh, beach attendance and can certainly be, can benefit from even, even further um, measurement of, you know, not only how many people are showing up to the beach, but what they're doing at the beach how long they're staying at the beach, and equally importantly, what would they be doing if they weren't at the beach? Uh, but from an economic <coughs> perspective, the part of the question is, well, you know, what's the next best alternative for them? Because that, that helps us determine what they're willing to pay or what their value is of going to the beach as opposed to the museum or going to the beach as opposed to leave town altogether and go to a cleaner beach in some other state. Um, and so those are all important questions that, that should be um, uh, asked and monitored through, through data collection. Uh, then on the other side, getting really good data on um, you know, what the pollution, the pollutant constituents are, and what are in fact being reduced by, say, CSO treatment, and what are being reduced by um, more command and control kind of uh, programs that may be in place for certain, for certain either certain pollutants or certain sources of pollutant uh, that that have to be uh, have to be controlled for. And then beyond that, we have the problem of non-point source emissions into the into most water bodies where it's not coming from a single source, it's just draining from, you know, everything from people fertilizing their lawns to, uh, to uh, you know, dogs being taken outside for walks for various purposes and uh, all sorts of other sources of, of other pollutants that manage to get into the water. And those, those may, in some instances, um, be more, more readily um, amenable to, to, uh, to less lower cost uh, reductions than these big, large programs. And, and those are the places where I suspect that some of the agencies, organizations like yours, um, can, can be the incubators, can be the testers of those kinds of programs. Uh, but again, it all comes back to um, you know, knowing what the constituents are, knowing something about what the, 
both the costs of reducing the mark and how effective the various options you have to reduce the mark. Because something may be a lot cheaper, but if it doesn't do the job as well, then it's not really cheaper. Uh, and that has to be kept in, kept in mind as well. Um, so I, I think there are rigorous ways in which you can, you can prioritize projects. Um, economists over the last 50 years now uh, have focused a great deal of effort on uh, natural resources and the environment, and, we, and we've developed techniques which we think are, 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 are robust to estimating what the benefits of reduced pollution, both air and water, are. Um, some of those have been tested in the courts and approved by regulatory agencies at the state, national, and local levels. Uh, and those can be employed. There are, I'm sure there are economists at all the local universities uh, who are doing that kind of work and it could be helpful to you. Um, you know, my, my colleague Dave Sunding and I do this work all the time for a, a, a variety of agencies. Um, and we can, we can measure um, benefits and the effectiveness of these programs uh, pretty precisely these days. On, on the cost and effectiveness side, uh, we have to really turn to engineers to help us do that kind of work uh, because they know they understand that clearly better than we as economists. Um, but we take pay close attention to that because what we're after at the end of the day is an efficient outcome, and that efficient outcome is defined by do the benefits equal or exceed the costs. And, and that goes right back to really the first question that uh, Kathy raised, which was do, do we want to use the same approach that we use for deciding whether to spend money on a congested bridge or non-congested bridge. Um, I mean, the answer to that, in, in, in true economics speak, is it depends. But but it largely depends, really, on getting the measurements accurately done. Uh, and 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 that's really, I think, the central theme here. Uh, and a, a lot of that information, I think, can be obtained by um, the efforts of Riverkeeper and other groups like that, who actually are on the ground or in the water. Um, and, and have these measurement programs that, that fill the gaps that can't be met by, by either federal or local agencies. And then on the benefit side, um, there's a number of things that, that a number of measurements that we, we use to, to look at those kind of values. Um, they're, they're, they're used uh, widely. They're being used in the, the Deepwater Horizon case right now to help estimate what the damages are to, the, to states and to fishermen and to uh, recreational uh, users, including beach goers and, and, and fishermen, commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen, um, fisher persons, I guess is more correct. Um, and so there's a place where we can really help. And let me just, just very quickly just talk to you about what some of those methods are. Um, as I indicated before, what we're, what we're really about from the economist perspective is trying to establish what society is willing to pay to obtain a certain objective or a certain level of pollution reduction or to meet a particular goal with respect to managing pollution. Uh, and so one of the most straightforward ways to do that, you would think, would be to actually measure that by asking people, how much would you be willing to pay? Uh, and it's, we use surveys to do that. Uh, it's a controversial method in part because, as you might suspect, if you're asked to do that and answer that kind of question without really no, thinking that it's going to come out of your pocket at the end of the day, you may answer very differently than you, you would if you were asked to, to write a check the next day for the amount you said you were willing to pay. And so there are means by which, through survey techniques, we try to get at that problem. Um, we know it's hard to do that cheaply, and so that method um, is, is often saved for, the, for really big stakes cases where there's a regulatory dispute or there's a big pollution event like the Water Horizon where there's lots of money at hand on, on both sides of the dispute. and. Uh, those kinds of studies can, are, are actually affordable. But the, the good news is that there's other ways to get at this. And the, 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 another way that we, we uh, do this work is through what's called a revealed preference. And there we, instead of asking people what they would do, we observe what people do. And we look to see whether or not um, they make conscious choices to either pay more or to drive further or to act in some other way when, when, a, when a, uh, say, a pollution event occurs. So, uh, as I was describing before, looking at beach data, we know that beaches uh, from time to time, including Jones Beach, as mentioned, and others here, uh, are closed from time to time because of the bacterial levels. And so we can look on those days uh, through data that can be collected these days, and often is, uh, on, well, on those days, the beach goers disappear. Where do they go to? What do they do instead? 
And so we can see whether or not we see jumps in attendance at, say, New Jersey beaches or Connecticut beaches, or maybe museum attendance goes up that day, or uh, we see uh, more restaurant, <laughs> restaurant activity. Some other set of events is replacing um, the, the use of the beach on that day. And that's a way in which we can infer a value by seeing, well, what are people's next best alternative? And we see what that costs them, and we can say, well, that difference between the, what it costs them to do their second best alternative and what they would have preferred to do tells us how much more they'd be willing to pay to actually be at the beach and gives us a measurement by which we can say, look, if you cleaned up this beach, if we reduced the number or eliminated the number of days closed because of material counts, there would be a, 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 a definite dollar benefit uh, that we would measure and is not surprising, sometimes quite large. Um, and then another method uh, we use is um, is simply um, uh, you know, uh, a, what's called a benefits transfer, where we can look to see um, uh, what kind of benefits were established in some other similarly situated uh, examples. So instead of looking at San, at, uh, at New York Bay, we look at uh, we look at Boston, or we look at San Francisco, or we look at, at somewhere else, and we see what studies have been done there, what those values are, and see if we can't perhaps with a little adjustment make use of those uh, in, the, in the city we're in. So there are a number of ways to do this. Some are expensive, some aren't so expensive. Uh, they're generally familiar to, to environmental economists uh, who are trained at many universities across the country, including here. Uh, and so I think there is a way to prioritize and, and, and help deal with exactly the kind of problems that the other panelists have been, have been raising here. And I'm sure you all um, face on a day-to-day -day basis as you decide where to put your dollars and what programs to push versus others, and I will end there. Thank you so much, Mark. We only have a couple of more minutes. <laughs> and um, I, I want to combine a couple of the questions we've gotten and then circle back to uh, Joan and Angela, who were taking notes uh, when they were listening to the other speakers, um, and, and see if they have some uh, reactions. Um, the, the question, it, which I think Philip declared himself on, and Mark did as much as an economist ever declares himself, is uh, should investments to improve water quality be prioritized by taking into account existing use? And, um, and, and Philip said, yeah. And uh, uh, Mark said, it depends, which is uh, a good economist's uh, answer to a lot of questions. Um, but, uh, uh, the the issue uh, that has also been raised in a number of the cards that you sent in is by opening up more waterfront access uh, to fishing, swimming, and boating, what expected impact will it have on the allocation of more resources uh, to regulate ongoing health and safety in these areas? And... Um, uh, Joan and Angela, I wondered if you if you had any thoughts on that. I do. Well, of course, when the designated use gets upgraded, that will drive water quality improvements. So, and that's how the Clean Water Act works, and that's that's a good thing in our view. But I would like to say here that EPA is very supportive of prioritizing, and we work with the uh, cities and the states and the communities to prioritize. And we have something that's called a tool that's called integrated planning to try to get us there. But what so so that's great, and you really and that will help to get water quality improvements sooner, and that's what we want. But what you won't hear EPA champion, championing. Uh, is we're not going to write off any water bodies. You know, you know this. EPA is there in Gowanus Canal, Newtown Creek, Passaic River, New York Harbor. We're, we're, we're here. We're not giving up on these water bodies. So that's uh, prioritizing is good, but we do have to follow the Clean Water Act. Sure. Um, you know, my reflections on this are that we have um, experienced a lot of innovation over the last 10 years. Green infrastructure is obviously a very smart approach. I mean, controlling stormwater at the source just makes sense rather than trying to control it at the end of the pipe where you're building large gray infrastructure or holding tanks that then have to pump that sewage back to a treatment plant. Um, they are sitting there idle during dry weather. They don't do any work for the community and they have a lot of high 
high energy costs and air quality, um, you know, impacts associated with emissions from the pumping. So I really, truly, firmly believe in the innovation and in the technology. And I think what we have now, I mean, this is just a thought, is that it's really that law of diminishing returns. So we made great strides. We improved the water quality tremendously. And this actually goes for air quality as well. Um, uh, we did a really good job of infusing a lot of cash and seeing a tremendous bang for the buck. And so the question now is, you know, driving that last 10%, driving that last 20%, how much are we really willing to pay to push that along? And, um, you know, my own belief is that we really do need, I, I love to follow the money. I think it tells a great story. You really need to look at the money. But I also love to follow the data. And, you know, and I agree with Philip. And I think one of the things that will, um, you know, drive the clarity on this issue is really looking at the contribution from the various sources. So what's happening in the Gowanus Canal? You know, is it the CSOs that are driving the pollutant levels and affecting the ecology and the habitat and the human enjoyment? Or is it the coal tar? Is it the, you know, uh, legacy from the industrial past and the PCBs and all of the pollutants that are there? Or is it the stormwater sources, you know, where we have, um, we thought that was a better plan, separate the sewers, um, and now we're not treating the stormwater, is maybe that stormwater flow what we need to address. So all of this is really very exciting right now because I think the information is emerging um, and it will help us drive the right policies. I, I, uh, I'm afraid that we're going to have to continue this in sidebars over drinks. So um, I, will you please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists? I will thank our wonderful moderator and the panel. Thank you. One more hand. Okay. I've got a couple of announcements. Very brief, fast. Well, as you heard, the bar is open. So uh, enjoy a drink if you can. If there, I think the bars there might be even uh, served up here. I'm, I'm, I was hoping that we'll be able to serve them, but they're right downstairs. There's a bar right in this room. Uh, we're going to start a discussion in a few moments about the South, the South Street Seaport and the future of that uh, place. So you can get a drink and enjoy that, or you can go downstairs uh, aft uh, on the main floor and salute our heroes of the harbor. The five groups that were featured this morning in the plenary session are going to be honored.